Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. Just before you get stuck into this episode, I wanted to let you know that in 2024, I'm going to be republishing my book, Red Eagle's America Secret Migs. That's the story of the 4477 Test and Evaluation Squadron and the program Constant Peg that exposed American fighter air crew to secretly acquired and operated MiGs in the Nevada desert in the 1970s and 1980s. The book's been out of print for a while. It goes for crazy prices online, but I'll be republishing as a softback exclusively through my website, 10percenttrue.com. If you're thinking about supporting the channel, you'd like to buy the book for yourself or even as a gift, please do go and place a pre-order. I'll put a link in the description. All pre-orders are going to be 25% off and I'll make sure I personally inscribe and sign your copy for you. Anyway, that's the plug for the book. I'll let you get back on with enjoying this episode. Take care. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really interesting when we started the last epi- the, the previous episode was you said you never lost to the F-15 in BFM in the Hornet. Um, so I just wondered whether or not... You know whether whether you could, whether you went out in those situations and then demonstrated your prowess and and your actions were able to speak louder than your words. Yeah, uh, this is a long answer if you're uh, Go ahead, uh, yeah. if you're happy yeah. because it relates to the um, the detachment we did to Elmendorf Air Base in Alaska. Look uh, again. Uh, let me just start with a bit of balance. Um, back to the back to the air combat um, trips that we did the one v one stuff. Um, yeah, I had I had my arse handed to me by plenty of F-16s. It was a really, really hard fight. Was the F-16, um, and I, I loathed fight fighting one v one against it because uh, I knew it was going to be hard. Um, I, I won fifty percent of the fights against an F-16 and got my ass shot off fifty uh, percent of the time. I never lost a one v one against the F-15 uh, in a Hornet because the Hornet is is spectacular. Um, uh, for that, an F-15 could uh, make it a hard fight and a long fight, but eventually, if I didn't run out of fuel, eventually uh, any Hornet pilot should be able to uh, to be an F-15. So we, uh, we find out that um, we're being deployed to Elmendorf Air Base for two weeks, and I'm I'm beside myself because I'm I'm going to get to see Alaska. You know, I'll probably never get to see that in my life. Um, all the reserves, though, I'd been on the squadron maybe about six months by then, so I knew them, I knew them really well. They were all moaning and whining about going to Elmendorf. I said, all right, okay, I can't understand it. It's cold and we're in California, but what's the big deal? And then the, I got this story, oh, we were there last year, Tom. All right, uh, and it didn't go well. <sighs> right, so what, what do you mean? Well, we went up there and they treated us like shit because we're reserves and fly brown hornets. They had this mindset that we were aggressors. And therefore, we were targets just for them. So they, the F-15s played blue air, so the friendlies, you know, every day. Normally, you'd, you'd swap blue air and red air around. Now, when you're red air, as a Hornet, you're not allowed to use your full-up radar. You have to use a uh, reduced range in the scope. You're not allowed to maneuver as hard as you can in a Hornet. You're not allowed to fly a Hornet. You're trying to be a MiG-29, and there's all sorts of restrictions. Basically, what you're supposed to go up there is suck suck on every AMRAM that they shoot at you. You never get closer than 20 miles away from each other, and they pat themselves on the back at a job well done. That's fine. I don't mind doing that, but we need to swap that each each day so that we get a chance to do blue air as well. Well, they didn't. The F-15, two F-15 squadrons up there, they played blue air every every day. And that's fine, but show a bit of kind of grace and class with it. They were high fiving each other in debriefs every time they got a shot. You know, it was it was that kind of uh, stuff. I don't mind having a bit of arrogance, a bit of fighter pilot arrogance, but you know, I have a bit of class uh, uh, with it. Anyway, so um, it goes to the end of that debt, and there's always a beer call and a bit of a present giving. And when you fly against an F-15 unit, they always give you a massive photograph of an F-15. You know, like you give a shit, you know. Uh, all right, oh, God, there's another picture of an F-15, super. And they write stuff around it and sign their names. That's normally what you would uh, what you present uh, back to them as well. But apparently uh, around the outside it was, hey, uh, great to see you in my gun site. Hope you managed to pick all the missiles out your ass and, and stuff like that. All right, bit of banter, but guys, you didn't let them fly F-18s. You, you know, they were flying crappy MiG-29s. So um, – now, the Marines, being reservists and being, uh, let's say, a little mischievous at uh, uh, best, they're present back to the F-15 squadrons. 
I, I, it's still making me laugh now, was a, pe- a, a block of arbitrary wood with a fake dog poo nailed onto it. And underneath it kind of said, thanks for nothing, it was shit, blood, BFA, BMFA 134. <laughs> now, uh, that, that got presented, but uh, crinkled faces from the uh, US Air Force. Uh, no, no kidding, Steve, this isn't urban legend. Apparently, it went right to the top of the Air Force. The commander of the Air Force walks across the Pentagon to the com- commandant of the Marine Corps and goes, have you seen this? You know, <laughs> So he sends it down with this shit on it. Anyway, their plan up at the Pentagon is, right, how should we sort this out? Let's throw them together again the following year, and they can they can sort it out. I like that's going to work, you know. So um, brilliant, brilliant senior officer thinking. So that we're all going up, and they've all got attitude, and I I, I can't wait to go. We arrive, and the allocators our accommodation, and it, it was almost like you know the admin officer went uh, right. You're, you're in the uh, uh, building four two nine. Your uh, transport is outside, and one of the marines said. Where are we staying? And he went, uh, building 429. Uh, the coach is outside. And he and this Marine, that one of our reservists went, is that the crack house? And, uh, and he goes, well, well, we don't like to call it that. And he goes, they put us in the fucking crack house again. Fucking hell. And all these Marines are raging. And I said to one of them, I said, uh, I said what's the crack house? And they said, worst accommodation you've ever seen, Tug. Uh, uh, yeah, it can't be that bad. It was two porter cabins, end on end, and they've been... <laughs> They'd been built on a swamp, and they had subsided into the swamp. This is this is absolutely true. I don't make this up. So we cut our way through a a, um, uh, a curtain of mosquitoes, get through the screen door, and and I walk down this corridor at an angle to get to my bedroom. Anyway, I dump my bags. There's a bed, a wardrobe, a sink. What more do you need for two weeks? And we hit downtown Anchorage. Have you ever been to Anchorage, Steve? Um, I've been to Almondorf, but not to Anchorage. No. Oh, my God. Anchorage in the 90s. That city was the last frontier, the final frontier of human decency. I I saw stuff in the bars there that turned my hair white <laughs> and, and turned it brown again afterwards. So it was, it was absolutely shocking what was going on in those bars. But we came out at 11.30 at night, and it was it was bright sunshine. Absolutely bright sunshine because we were there middle of summer. Took my breath away. Got back to the uh, crack house, had a quick shower, and and then thought I'll, I'll you know get some kip. We've only got in briefs the next day. I go to close my curtains, and they met there. And there was <laughs> there was like twelve inches between the curtains, with the sun streaming through my window. I just thought, oh god, I, I was I was hanging out of my ass by the end of that two weeks. I didn't get a decent night's sleep at all. Anyway, it started off, usual thing, we're playing Red Air. The It's the F-15 benefit concert. You know, they shoot everybody <laughs> down. They they blah, 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 and, and, and this. And so, anyway, they compromised one day, and they said, um, sorry, I finally got to the part of the story you're interested in. They compromised one day and said, um, right, we'll do 1v1 uh, air combat, dissimilar air combat. And so we're thinking, right, you full up on it. Yep, full up on it, full up F-15. Awesome. So this is our chance to just redress the balance a little bit. Um, and each time each time we did one, we, we had two F-15s and two F, uh, F-18s, and we'd split off to opposite ends of the area, one F-15, one F-18, and, and we'd fight. So I go into the briefing with a, a, a guy, his call sign is Stane, and he was XF4, and I think he had 2,000 hours F-18. And he was one of these older guys who'd been there a while, but holy shit, he was still he was still sharp as, as nails. So we go in there and we sit down. There's a brand new guy out of training on the, on the F-15 uh, who's doing a bit of work up, and a newly qualified air combat leader. So this young lad, he looks like he was 12 years old, you know. So he's briefing up, and he starts off with, right, how many hours have you got on the uh, uh, Hornet stain? And he said, uh, just over 2,000. And he went, tug. And I said, uh, about 400. And he said, okay, so what would it, we have to have an air combat leader in each pair. And I thought, yeah, I'm an air combat leader as well, son. You know, uh, have you not <laughs> tweaked that I'm wearing a Union Jack and RAF wings? I'm not a bog standard Marine here. But he just didn't, he didn't tweak any of that. So he goes, right, stain, if you can take Beaker out, you know, and, uh, and, and Tug, I'll show you the ropes. I, no, 
<laughs> All right. So it's fine. And and you just you just sort of chomp down on it because it's the F-15s and, and that's what they are. So anyway, we get we get into our little briefings. He starts trying to teach me air combat in the uh, in the Hornet. Oh, right, okay. So oh, we'll let this ride because we're going to fight against each other. It's, I think it's going to be ugly for him. So we'll, we'll just see how he how he goes. And then he, um, uh, bearing in mind, I taught air combat for three years on the Hawk, and I'd been teaching it on the F eighteen as well. well. Well, fair enough. And then he said something. It, I thought we'll, we'll, we'll go okay. And then he he just wound me up completely with this with one of his comments he said um do you want to do an offensive set first you know with with me and up on the perch like that and you you do the offensive first stuff just to just to get your eye in and stuff like that and i went no mate i think we'll go straight in and see how it goes shall we and he went okay but if you need a break during the trip you you just let me know and we'll do an offensive perch okay and that was the thing and that's i, I thought I'm not sure if this kid knows where the cleaners is, but at the end of this trip, he fucking will because that's where I'm going to take him, you know. So, uh, I mean, oh, God, I sound really arrogant, don't I? But he just rubbed me up the wrong way. And we went out. We had three splits. And uh, and I thought, I'm going to teach him a thing or two here, not about just the manoeuvring of air combat, but about attitude and, and being humble. Uh, the first split, I did, I did a, a deception thing on the, on the first split, um, which he didn't pick up at all, and so we ended up merging. Uh, what what he did was he called tally uh, as we coming towards each other. I'm supposed to call tally, and then he'll call fights on. Um, so he calls tally, and I just kept quiet, and started waggling my wings like that, which is the um, international sign that you've lost your radio. So what he should have done was terminated the fight there, okay, and the trick wouldn't have worked. What he did was he floated right past me, going. Uh, tug radio check uh, like that. At which point I just turned in behind him, and and gunned him, and <laughs> and that's I mean that's a stupid little uh, little thing, but he wasn't ready for it because he's he's newly promoted as an ACL and he thinks he knows everything, and uh, and he didn't. Uh, the second one I did a, a, a once you've lost the first fight you're screwed mentally you you're absolutely screwed and you're not going to be on your game. The second fight I I did a really stupid thing at the merge i dumped all of my speed pre-merge and um and as he turned across my tail i went single circle and at low speed the 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 f-18's nose just whipped round uh, like that it wasn't a great tactic to tell you the truth but if you were nose pointing it, it was it was great i mean we were in min range for for everything apart from the gun but i didn't have the energy to saddle up and and gun him so I just over the radio, I called Fox 2 as if I'd fired a Sidewinder. I hadn't fired it at all because I was hugely min range. But the idiot popped flares out and started um, uh, defending against an imaginary missile. Uh, that and, and he just ditched, ditched all his speed. While he was doing that, I was just unloading to get uh, to get speed on the aeroplane. And now he's in my he's in my shit box, you know, which is low speed. And the F-18 it, it was unbeatable at, at that, so I ended up uh, gunning him there. And then um, the third split, I, I did it. I played. I played it properly. I, I did it as if we uh, we just merged. And um, my my Hornet did its beautiful pirouetting, batshit crazy maneuver thing that that, that it did. And uh, it was almost like I could have let go of the stick, and the jet would have um, uh, would have beat him on its own. And uh, and oh, that was it. Just prior to the last um, split, um, uh, I said to you last time, one v one's not real. Mm. It's about what goes on up here and, and what's in your heart. So um, you can win the fight before the merge. On the third one, bearing in mind he's been gunned twice because I've played tricks on him, and and it's not gone the way that he thought it was going to. The third one, I, I just I just said, shall we go two shot kill? On the uh, on the radio, rather than just one shot to kill, we'll do two shots uh, to kill. It's a thing that we do to prolong fights a little bit, and you could hear it in his voice. He was absolutely lost, and he went, uh, "Yeah, and let's do two shot. Uh, we'll do two shot kill then." And I said, "Oh, sorry, mate, you you misunderstand. I'll go two shot kill. You know, you just stick with single shot." And um, and and he he was just beaten down. He was finished uh, by that. When we get into the debrief afterwards. Um, I don't mind. I don't mind that so long as you, like I said, you go a bit mea culpa, 
he caught me out there and and stuff. My God, he started debriefing like uh, like he was the air combat leader, and and it was shocking to see that he was trying to pull some kind of victory out of this. I mean, disastrous trip that he uh, that he'd been on. And uh, a few minutes in, I just said, that, "That was it." He he asked me, you know, what um what what speed did you have on the aeroplane? This was on the second one where I ditched all the speed. I, I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, what do you mean you don't know? I, oh, you know, I had, I had 320 knots at this point. But I said, congratulations, you, you died with a great energy package on, on your aeroplane. And he went, what do you mean? I said, right, just sit down. I got him to sit down and I said, look, I'm, I'm not your bog standard Marine. I've been teaching air combat for a number of years and we did a proper uh, debrief on it. And, um, and it, to to be fair, at the end of it, he he was he was a bit shell shocked by the by the whole thing. But you know, he he took it on the uh, took it on the chin because he had no other option uh, but to do that. So that's the only time you know, that we would redress the balance. If I was, um, I told you about a Top Gun instructor last time who was all over me. Mm. Okay, and he absolutely destroyed me. Um, but I wanted to know in the debrief how he was able to do that. And so even if you've lost or you've or you've beaten somebody up, the debrief is there to learn um, about about what why you got into that that position in the first place. And I would always, if I was flying against somebody who was less experienced, if they lost the first fight, we'd generally look at, right, how can we do a bit of stuff over the radio? You know, right, this time, have a go at trying this, um, because that will be a problem for me. And there was a couple of times during that trip, he could have been all over me um, if he'd recognised what I was doing mm. and the fact that I ditched all the energy on the second one. He could have just powered out of it and, and left me stranded, you know, in a uh, really in the hurt locker. But um, but he he was so off his game by then because I'd, I'd beaten him up on the first the first one. Um, that and that's what I was trying to say to him. It's not just about the manoeuvring of the aeroplane. You, you you're constantly talking about the energy, how much speed you've got, and uh, EM diagrams and and things like that. That's not what this is. This is about who you are as a person. You know, do you really want to beat me? How do, do you want it more than I do? And 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 taught him that side of things rather than just the pure maneuvering uh, of it. And you know, I, d I didn't lord it over him. I, I I'd adjusted that attitude in the air. I, I felt and. Um, and, but the debrief's not uh, not for that, unless they come at you with a bit of fire, in which case it is, you know, 